Tonight we want to talk about the process of change. How many of you want to have a change in some area of your life? Okay. Well, I need to back up and ask another question first. How many of you want to change yourself? You know, usually we have to change before our circumstances change. Did you know that? Did you know that? Usually we have to change. And many times God's using our circumstances to drive us to him to finally get open enough to let him do what he wants to do in our lives. I think before we will really let God take over, we have to come to the end of ourselves. And that takes a while because we're pretty strong. And some of us, it takes longer than others because we, we want to do it. We've got good ideas, even for God. Amen. Well, now, God, you could do this. Have you ever done that? Well, God, you could do this. Like he really needs our advice. That's pretty silly, right? But the word change means to transform, to change the nature, the function, or the condition of, or to convert. Now, you know, new believers are often called new converts because if any man be in Christ, he is changed. Something wonderfully amazing happens to him on the inside. He doesn't look any different. If he was overweight, he's still overweight. If he was bald, he's still bald. He doesn't look any different. And most of the time, day one doesn't act that much different. He might be a little happier and have a little more peace. And, but we still see some of the same issues. Well, if we're new creatures, how and why do we still act in old ways? It's so simple when we see it. It's just because what God has done in us by his grace and mercy totally is a gift to us that we receive only by faith. There's nothing that God does for us at the new birth that we can ever earn or deserve. Now, I had an idea when I was studying for this. This is a converter. And if you ever travel out of the country, you know how important these are. Because if I don't have one of these when I go out of the country and I would take my flat iron and plug it into the wall, it would fry it. <laughs> so we're going to pretend like the power in the wall is God. Now, if I would just go in my own condition and try to plug into God without going through Christ, God's holiness and my unholiness would have a collision and we literally could not survive in the presence of God. So Christ becomes our converter <laughs> and he's plugged into God because he did everything just right and then we come and we plug into him and then through him we can communicate with God but only through him. Amen? I'm not going out of the country here in a couple of weeks without my box full of converters. And I want to encourage you to always stay plugged into your converter, which is Jesus Christ, because through him, you can go to God, know that you're righteous through him. In his name, you can come and pray and ask for anything, because the good news is, is whatever we're not, Jesus is in our place. I even, I don't think that we can even pray one perfect prayer. We, we probably can't even pray a prayer that God could receive an answer if we didn't go in the name of Jesus. But when we go in the name of Jesus, whatever I didn't say right, Jesus takes it and fixes it up before it's presented to the Father. And then it just sounds like this perfect prayer that he's all happy to answer. Stay plugged in. The worst thing in the world you can do is get unplugged. Sometimes when you start running out of power, you need to just go do what you would do to your battery, plug in for a while. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. When he's converted, he becomes a new creature on the inside. 
Let's look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. No one born or begotten of God deliberately, knowingly, and habitually practices sin. Now, it doesn't say he can't sin. It doesn't even say that he doesn't sin. It says that he does not deliberately, knowingly, habitually practice sin. In other words, anyone who's born of God, if you're truly born again, there's got to be some kind of change. Amen? And there should be continual change as we go along. The path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter every day. We are changed into his image from glory to glory. We're in a process of being changed, and God is not upset that we have not arrived. None of us have arrived. The Apostle Paul said, I have not arrived. But one thing I do, I press on. In Christ, you don't have to be mad at yourself or feel guilty and condemned because you're not fully, completely what you ought to be yet. Matter of fact, the more guilt and condemnation you drag around with you, the less likely you are to keep changing. Focusing on what's wrong with you just redoubles the strength of that problem. Why does he not deliberately knowing and habitually practice sin? Because God's nature abides in him. Everybody say, God's nature is in me. God, wait, I want you to just think about this a minute. Say, I'm God's house. Now, just close your little peepers there for a minute and say this and think about it. God lives in me. Woo. Think about it. Now, that's what it means to be a Christian. It doesn't mean, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I go to church. I mean, there's so much to this than just a Sunday morning, 45-minute trip to church where we can't hardly wait to get out. That is not full-on Christianity. Amen? You are the home of God, and everywhere you go and everywhere I go, we are supposed to represent him. The Bible says that we are God's personal representatives and that he is making his appeal to the world through us. So we need more than a bumper sticker. We need good fruit. And all the fruit of the Spirit is in you at the new birth. It's all there. When you receive Christ, you also receive the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit lives in you. God lives in two places, his throne in heaven, but he also lives in his house here on earth, which is us. He lives in us individually and collectively as a body. And just think about this, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of you. We are not just a bunch of people gathered here tonight, hearing a good speaker. Wow. God's nature abides in us. And I love the Amplified Bible. It's kind of blunt like I am. And it says, God's nature abides in him, his principle of life. The divine sperm <laughs> remains permanently within him, and he cannot practice sinning. Doesn't say he doesn't sin, but he cannot practice sinning because he is born and begotten of God. Now, why can you not just go ahead and be just a full-on sinner? Now, I mean, if you're truly born again, I'm not just talking about you said a sinner's prayer and nothing changed. I'm talking about you threw yourself on the mercy of God. You admitted that you were a sinner. You asked Christ to come into your life, and you really are working with the Holy Spirit toward positive change in your life. You've not arrived. You've still got lots of issues. You've still got lots of baggage. But if you really look back, although you're not where you need to be, thank God you're not where you used to be. Now, let me say something to you that's important. Be more excited about how far you've come than you are discouraged about how far you have to go. 
I'm going to say that again. Be more excited about how far you've come than you are discouraged about how far you have to go. If you listen to the Holy Spirit, he'll remind you of how far you've come, what all he's done in your life. But if you listen to the devil, all you're ever going to hear is, well, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not. It's interesting. There's not one scripture that tells me what I'm not. All I see in the Bible is I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. I am loved. I am the righteousness of God. I am free. I am redeemed. I am sanctified. I am justified. I am a child of God. I am loved. <laughs> so when you hear everything you're not, remember that's the devil. And what you could do is thank him. You should say, thank you for reminding me what a mess I am and how good God is to put up with me. Turn the tables back on him and he'll be sorry that he ever messed with you. This scripture is so good. The divine sperm. Okay. So that means for all intent and purposes, we are pregnant with godliness. The divine seed, the sperm of God has been planted in the womb of our spirits. And just as a baby grows, we grow spiritually and become Christ-like in all of our behavior. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And it wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get to the point where we could say, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. I'm not ready to say that yet, but I'm growing. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. I don't even have the nerve to do that. Hey, just watch me. If you do whatever I do, you're going to be in good shape because I'm following Christ. I mean, they made some bold statements that literally, if we said things like that, people would think we were heretics. Amen? It's so important for people to know who they are in Christ, how much they're loved, and what you have in you, in you. It hasn't all shown up on the outside yet, but it's making its way there. Just like you plant seed in the ground, and if you water it and you keep the weeds away from it, it will grow. Now, the only other thing that can, can cause it not to grow is if the ground is no good. But when we're planted in the ground of God, the ground is always good. Amen. And he's planted himself in us individually and collectively as a body and we're growing, 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 growing. Now, usually before growing comes some kind of chastisement. I'll go tell them. <laughs> usually before growing some comes some kind of chastisement or we see in the word, you know, that we need to change. It's like I told you this morning, I said to my friend Penny, have you ever had a problem with pride? She said, not till you started teaching on it. <laughs> so guess what? You may find out tonight that you've got some problems you didn't know you had. I had all kinds of problems I didn't know I had. I thought everybody else had a problem. I kept praying for Dave to change and God told me Dave wasn't the problem. <laughs> I didn't get it. I thought, well, if he's not the problem, who is? There's only me and him. It can't be. You know, we never think that it's us. And I think real spiritual maturity is to be able to receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit and not let it condemn you. Oh boy, another thing wrong with me. No, we need to get to the point where we say, thank you, God, that you love me enough that you're not going to leave me alone, ignorant and blind to my mess. I want to know the truth so the truth can make me free. We're all in a process of change. God supplies us with everything that we need for total transformation, which is another word for change. He restores us. He brings us back to an original state. 
He puts us back in a position that he intended us to have before Satan ever got involved in man's business. God wants to restore man to the original plan that he had for him in the garden. And a lot of that plan was fellowshipping with him, spending good time with God, having an awareness that he's with you all the time and that he cares about every single thing that concerns you. I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes God just likes to show out and let you know that he cares about things that you wouldn't even begin to think that he would care about. I had a really cute and unique thing happen just last week. Sometimes I get some unique things sent to me at the office. And, you know, people are just so sweet. And many times, even though what they want to give doesn't make any sense to me, it's what they had to give. And so I've learned to receive graciously. And if it's not something for me, then I'll pass it on to somebody else. So somebody sent me an $85 gift certificate to the tractor supply store. Now, if you're watching my TV or if you happen to be here, don't be offended. This turns out really good. But honestly, I didn't have a clue what I was going to do. And I looked and I thought, now, why would somebody send me me? You know. But I know people give what they have to give. And God sees that just as precious seed as anything else. Well, I don't like to waste anything that anybody gives. And so I had it on my counter and I'm kind of moving it around for about a month thinking, what am I going to do with that? I don't know what I'm going to do with that. I asked my daughter if she wanted it. She said, I don't go to the tractor supply store. So I'd move it around a little bit more. And so one day last week, I think it was last Monday, I was working out with my trainer and, uh, I do that three days a week. And uh, in the midst of my workout, he said, yeah, when I leave here today, I got to go pick up a part from the tractor supply store. I said, wow. No. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Have I got a gift for you? Now, here's the thing that was funny. His part cost $85.64. Now, he, he's a believer, and me and him both, it's like, can you believe that God cared enough about that woman's gift to make sure it got used properly, about this guy who could have paid for his part? It's not about whether you can pay for it or not. It's just like, we were just like kind of awestruck, like two little kids really tickled that God cared about his tractor part. Come on, give God a praise. Intimacy with God is so wonderful, isn't it? To know that he's your best friend. Isn't that cool? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Bring it to me and I'll take care of it. He doesn't want us to be under something all the time. He wants us to know that we're the head and not the tail above and not beneath and that we have authority and power. You have power. So stop acting like a weakling. Stop saying, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And say, through Christ, I can, I can, I can, I can. He doesn't want us to be under pressure, under stress, under attack. <laughs> I'm sure you run into people, how are you today? Well, I'm under attack. How are you today? I'm under pressure. Well, you know what? The Lord spoke to me one time. If you'd stay on the attack, you wouldn't be under attack all the time. And we need to live with an attitude of knowing who we are in Christ and who we belong to. Not a belligerent attitude, but instead of going, out, get those shoulders back, hold your head up. Amen. 
Know that you have the power of God on the inside of you. The nature of God is on the inside of you. And you're changing every day being molded into his image through the power of Christ. Amen. Now, we all want to be changed, but we don't all want to change. <laughs> Think about it. If I say to everybody in here, do you want to be changed? Oh, God. But see, we, what we want is we don't want to be transformed. We want to be translated. We want to just be here and then all of a sudden be there. Oh, God, change me. And woo. Superman in the phone box. We're changed. Well, it doesn't work that way. You're going to find out <laughs> about transformation and the little process that's a little messy. Change is a sign that we're alive. It's a sign that we're growing. We're born for change. We get bored with sameness. Listen, I'm content, but I am not satisfied to the point where I never want to see any change. Change is refreshing. We even just changed some of the way that we're doing some of the media presentation in the meeting. Some of it we just stuck in a different place just to shake it up a little bit. Here's a statement that I want you to get a hold of. Change can be initially frightening, but eventually refreshing. Come on now. Change can be initially frightening, but eventually refreshing. Here's a good example. I got to the point in the ministry where I felt like I just couldn't work as hard as I was. And in particular, I really needed to get rid of a lot of the office work and just really give myself to the spiritual part of the work that God has called me to do, writing and teaching and preaching and studying and praying and things like that. And not, you know, hiring and managing several hundred people and doing all the correcting and all the stuff that goes on with running an office. And so our son, Dan, was working for us, and we really felt like that he would be right to be put in the position of CEO. But he's, he's kind of like me. When he takes over, he takes over. And... Uh, so he started wanting to make changes, and he was making changes, and I was like, <laughs> didn't want to change anything. So you see, a lot of times we want to get rid of pressure, but we don't want to give up anything. Or we want to give somebody a job to do, but no authority. Come on, did you hear me? We want to give them a workload, but no authority. You can't create something that I don't like. And so it took a while for me to get from being upset and frightened to being refreshed. Now I love it. I've worked through it. And now I don't have to be there day in and day out. I don't have to be in a four-day meeting about what kind of computer program we're going to get next. There's so many things now that I don't have to do that somebody else is more highly anointed to do than I am. But I'm telling you, in the beginning, it was scary to let some of it go. You know, most of us pray for change, but then when it comes, we have a tendency to fight it. Change can be very difficult. It's like we want something new, but we have a hard time letting go of the old. And so we're offering you some teaching today called How to Survive Change. You know, that's a really a lot of great word coming your way if you will just contact us and say, yes, I want to know how to let God change me and I want to know how to change my word so I can have a better life. God's got such an awesome plan for each and every one of us. And yes, that includes you. I said, God has got an awesome plan for your life. You know, you may be sitting right now, maybe you feel like you're at the end of your rope or you just feel like it's been so long since anything good has happened to you. But I can tell you that God does have a good plan for your life. And although you may be going through difficulties right now, you will come out of this. This too will pass 
and there's good things on the other side of it. So don't you get discouraged and give up. God bless you and have a great day. Life is full of change. If we can learn to trust God in times of change and allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives during change, we can experience the joy of His transformation in our lives. Learn how a transformed mind comes before a transformed life with Joyce's four CD series, How to Survive Change. The Holy Spirit comes to... Well, we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. We've asked for some of your questions, and so we're going to sit up here and have a little interview, and I'm going to try to answer some of the questions that you've asked, and I don't know what they are, so you got to pray for me that I'll know the answers. <laughs> well, we are really happy to have a lot of really great questions tonight, and these all came from you right here in Columbia, South Carolina, so be listening for your question, and normally we will ask for a particular topic. We didn't do that tonight, so these are ask anything you want. Oh, thank you. So, and she's always ready. She's always ready. Some of these are a little bit more personal. You want to start with a little more personal one? Sure. Okay. What's she going to say? We got her, right? Okay, this is from Angie right here in Columbia. And she says, do you find it sometimes difficult to take your own advice? <laughs> <laughs> Dave is yelling back there. He's got answers. Well, first of all, I'm wondering if Angie's following me around and knows something that I don't know. But, you know, I, I, I obviously do sometimes, you know. And what's really, really, really annoying is when I'm having a hard time and somebody reminds me of what I preached. <laughs> somebody being behind me back here. And uh, I remember one time I was going through something really tough and I'm, oh God, what are you? What do you want me to do, God? What do you want me to do? And so clearly I heard him say, just do what you'd tell somebody else to do if they came to you with this situation. <laughs> so I do feel that it's very important for me not to preach something that I'm not willing to do. And so although I do struggle like everybody else does, hopefully and prayerfully I come back around to, in the end, doing what I know is right. Yeah. <laughs> it can be a project sometimes. Yeah. Jalisa asks... Was there a moment in your life where you felt God's love for you, even though you didn't love yourself, and you decided that you had to make a change? Yes, in 1976, in the month of February, already being a Christian, I was going to work one morning, and I really just cried out to God, something is wrong, something's missing, and uh, it's too long of a story to get into, but that day God really touched my life in a special way. And one of the things that I really felt, I felt like I was drunk on the love of God for about three weeks. Just literally. Um, and you know, when God pours his love into you, then you begin to love more. And I mean, I was even in love with weeds. I remember driving past a field full of weeds and thinking, oh, God made those weeds. They're just so... And I'd like to tell you that I stayed that way the rest of my life, but pretty soon the Holy Spirit said, grow up time. Now we can't do it on feelings. <laughs> yeah. All right. Heather from Anor, South, Car South Carolina, wants to know, um, I've been diagnosed with panic attacks and generalized anxiety disorder. I continue to ask God why he's allowed this, and I haven't seemed to have gotten a response. I'm asking for healing, but I want to know, is there anything that you could say that might help? Well, first of all, I think that there's always a root to anxiety and stress. It can be as simple as different neurotransmitters and hormones being out of balance in your body, but it can also be as serious as something in a person's past that's hidden that needs to be dealt with. One thing I do firmly believe, if you ask God Sometimes we just want God to heal us, and what we need to do is ask him, what's the root of my problem? Amen? Um, because to be honest, if he heals us, and we've still got the poisonous root inside of us, it's just going to pop up somewhere else. Obviously, stress is a huge ordeal today, 
you know, as far as God allowing or not allowing, yes, we know God is sovereign. He can do anything he wants to. And sometimes things take longer than we want them to. The enemy is the source of all of our problems. But God has his own reasons for why some things take longer than they do. And, you know, a great example is when I was being sexually abused by my dad, I prayed for God to get me out of the situation. I prayed diligently and he didn't get me out, but he gave me the strength to go through. And it's that very thing now that I'm using to really help a lot of people. So this is one question that we, we receive from multiple people. And it's just because of everything that we're seeing in the news right now and what is happening. And it says, what advice do you have for believers as a response to what's going on with racial tension and law enforcement right now? Okay, well, um, first of all, we're all one in Christ. And... And, you know, I, I think you'll hear my heart when I say this. Before we're black or white, we're God's children. Amen. And um, I think we know that strife and hatred and revenge and war, that, that's, that's from the devil. The devil is the one who instigates that kind of stuff. And so, obviously, we want to pray. We definitely want to see justice, not black justice or white justice, but God's justice in every situation. Amen. And I know there's been a lot of terrible things happen in the past, but we all still have to take the same advice that in order to go on and live a good life, we must let go of the things that are behind and press together toward the future that God has for us. And I think that the number one thing that we need to do, in addition to praying for truth to come out and for justice, is we really need to walk in love. That's our job as Christians, is to walk in love with everybody. It's a great answer. That's really good. And, and it's such a good encouragement for us. One final question. And this is oh, something... I'm having fun. Can we oh, do we more? can ask more if you want. <laughs> This is something that I know that you get asked a lot, but I believe that it's because it's just such a vital issue for so many people. But they are asking, how do you balance ministry, parenting, and work? Okay, well... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or another question. <laughs> no, here's, here's the truth. I think that for anybody to stay balanced in life or to keep their priorities straight, I don't think it's something you do one time and then it's always right after that. I think you're always straightening them out. You're always readjusting. We have a tendency as people to just swing from out of balance to out of balance to out of balance <laughs> to out of balance because that's the way the flesh is. And it, balance is very important. And obviously, my walk with God comes before anything, but my family comes before my ministry. Now, have I had to give anything up? Has my family had to sacrifice anything for me to do this? Absolutely, 100%. I'm a good mother, but I'm not a normal mother. I'm a good wife, but I'm not a normal wife. No comment? <laughs> but see, that's part of our problem today. We think everybody needs to fit in one box, and they don't need to. So really... I believe when God calls somebody that if they'll receive it, there's an anointing on everybody. I marvel at how Dave can sit down there and listen to me tell the same stories and say the same thing over and over, over and over, over. I mean, I could not do what he does. And he just says, that's my call. That's what I'm called to do. So I'm anointed to talk and he's anointed to listen. We live in a world where trust is difficult to gain and easily broken, yet we all need a safe place where we can trust fearlessly. Come, connect with the one who won't let you down, whose love for you never, ever fails. At the 35th anniversary Love Life Women's Conference, featuring Joyce Meyer and her guests, Joel Osteen, John Gray, Michael W. Smith, 
Chris Tomlin, CC Winans, Ruth Graham, and Dave Meyer. You want to really make the devil mad? Trust God and enjoy your life while God is solving your problem. So quit trying to figure it all out and say, God, I'm going to take the limits off of you. I know one touch of your favor can get me to where I'm supposed to be. Early bird pricing ends May 31st, so register today. The 2017 Love Life Women's Conference. So I'm going to ask you a question tonight. Did you come here to change or just to see what I look like in real life? First, we change. We get tested a little bit. Oh, God's got some good stuff ready for you. But he's going to check you out first to see how you act without it. To see if you can be happy with just him and not the stuff. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And you shall earnestly remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, to know what was in your mind and heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So you see, God kept them in a difficult place because he was working some things out of them and he was proving them and testing them to see if they would still worship him and keep his commandments even in hard times. If we will not worship God in the wilderness, we won't. won't. him on the mountaintop and he humbled you and he allowed you to hunger and he fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you recognize and personally know that man does not live by bread only but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God bread is stuff so we could just put in there man does not live by his things and by his stuff. That's not where his real life is at. But man lives by the word of God. I hope and pray, and I've been praying about this for a lot of years. If I ever don't have this ministry anymore, and I'm not doing what I'm doing, I hope to God that I can still be just as happy and still know that I'm just as valuable to God as his child as I am as his preacher. Look at me and let me tell you something. You are more than what you do. And when you know that, then you're free to do anything. You can wash a toilet and be happy. You can be on the platform and be happy. As long as you know that you're in the place that God has for you, you can be happy. You don't have to be in a public position to be happy. You're just happy in Christ. I want to say it again. You are more than what you do. We're not human doings. We're human beings. Your clothing did not get old, nor did your feet swell these 40 years. I like that because... They never got any new clothes, but God anointed the ones they had so they didn't wear out. <laughs> How many of you have been wearing the same four or five outfits so long you're about ready to scream? <laughs> this little boy down here has got his hand up. <laughs> he must be all of six or seven. Know also that in your minds and hearts that as a man disciplines and instructs his son, so the Lord disciplines and instructs you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and reverently to fear him. Now here it comes. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A 
land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs, flowing forth in valleys and hills, of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey. And I know that's not what we're after, but just put other words in there. A land in which you shall eat food without shortage and lack nothing in it. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. But here it comes. And when you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for all the good land which he has given you. And beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his precepts, and his statutes, which I command you this day. So here it is. We're desperate. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. And God tests you. He doesn't give you everything you want for a while. Then he brings you into a land where you've got all the good stuff. Things are perking up. You got the promotion. You got married. You got your kids. You got the new house. And now he's saying, you better not forget me. You know, people wouldn't be so desperate all the time if they would act like they're desperate all the time anyway. Because really, we are desperate for God. God, I don't care what I own. I've got to have you. I need you. Deuteronomy 8 is so important to me because I went through that not only as an individual, but in this ministry. I had a big vision and things stayed little so long, I thought that I would just pull out every hair that I had. When you have a big vision and nothing is happening, it's tough. It's hard. When you see the promises of God and you just know that that's what God has for you, but it's just not happening, it's challenging. But those are good times and we need to not throw those times away. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, that we are recreated in Christ, born again and predestined to do good works, which God has planned ahead of time, taking paths that he prepared that we should walk in them, living the good life that he prearranged and made ready. So it's like, here's this good life that God has prearranged and made ready, but he said, there's a path that I've got laid out for you to get there. <laughs> and along this path is where God is changing us and teaching us and training us how to behave. And the more of that we walk in, the more all the good stuff. of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. You know, I didn't always do meetings in arenas. Oh man, I did meetings in every kind of little banquet room that you can imagine where we'd have to go in and clean up the floors and the place would smell like fried chicken from the banquet the night before. I've done meetings in hotel ballrooms where the ceiling tiles were falling down and the rain was coming in through the ceiling and somebody would come in from the hotel while I was trying to preach and stick a ladder up in the ceiling and climb up on the ladder. The first TV show that I did, we had one camera, a low ceiling in a real small room and I had what amounted to a blue shower curtain behind me. <laughs> and God anointed it and it worked. And I think a lot of times God doesn't want us to give us a bunch of stuff to support us because he wants us to know that it's he that lifts us up. God is the one that lifts up us. Promotion doesn't come from man. Real promotion comes from God. Amen. Metamorphosis. It's another word for transformation 
are changed. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says we are changed and transformed into his image. And that word change there or transformed is the word metamorphosis. All of us as with unveiled face because we continue to behold in the word of God as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are constantly being. <laughs> Doesn't say it gets done one time and never happens again. We are constantly being changed into his very own image. God is changing us. That word means to undergo a complete change, which under the power of God will find expression in character and conduct. So I love that. God has done something wonderful in us. He's made a deposit in us. He's put the seed of all kinds of good things in every single one of you. If you're born again, you are God's home. God's spirit lives in you. His nature lives in you. His seed is in you. And God is working in your life. And what you need to do is yield and cooperate. And then gradually that seed makes its way through the ground of your soul and eventually gets out here where it can be seen in your character and your conduct. We don't get to act like everybody else. We don't get to be hateful with the slow clerk. Come on, I know, I used to do it. I'd have my big Jesus rhinestone pin on my coat. Poor new girl at the register ran out of tape or there wasn't some prices on items and I was wanting to get home to be spiritual. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> Big thing. And I remember I had a fuchsia coat so it's, whoa, whoa. I thought that made me spiritual. I mean, how dumb can we get and still breathe? You will know them by their fruit, not by their bumper sticker and their Christian jewelry and their CD player and all that stuff, you know? And so I got to a point where I would pray when I went to the grocery store. Now, God, lead me to the line where there's a clerk that knows what she's doing. And just as sure as I'm standing here, I'd get in another one of those lines. And it took me a while, but I finally got it. God's doing this on purpose. Because he wants me to get to the point where I can stand here and be patient and be kind and nice to her and just tell her, don't worry about it. Hey, we're all new at something sometimes. Just, it's good. Now, during change, when God is dealing with us and working in us and working on us, Emotions are very undependable during those times. That's not a good time to make a serious decision. You know, even if you move to a new area, across state to a new area, and you've left all your friends behind.
be careful even about the decisions you make during times like that because change is something we need and want but it's not always easy for one thing we want change because we're not fully satisfied with what we've got we want something new but we don't want to give this up because whatever we're gonna have we don't know what that is yet and the thing about God that is so aggravatingly interesting is that he won't show us what the next thing is normally until we let go of this thing and take a chance on having nothing that's what it means to fully depend on God amen he told Abraham pack up your tent and go to the place that I will show you after you start moving well show me and I'll go no go and I'll show you well show me and I'll go no go and I'll show you you know most of us pray for change but then when it comes we have a tendency to fight it change can be very difficult it's like we want something new but we have a hard time letting go of the old and so we're offering you some teaching today called how to survive change you know that's a really a lot of great word coming your way if you will just contact us and say yes I want to know how to let God change me and I want to know how to change my words so I can have a better life God's got such an awesome plan for each and every one of us and yes that includes you I said God has got an awesome plan for your life and you know you may be sitting right now maybe you feel like you're at the end of your rope or you just feel like it's been so long since anything good has happened to you but I can tell you that God does have a good plan for your life. And although you may be going through difficulties right now, you will come out of this. This too will pass. And there's good things on the other side of it. So don't you get discouraged and give up. God bless you and have a great day.